Good morning, everyone from an icy London and good afternoon and good evening to everyone joining us in Malaysia and across Asia. My name is Ben Bland. I'm the director of the Asia Pacific program here at Chatham House in London. And it's my pleasure to be chairing this webinar with you all today. I've been studying or working on Malaysian politics for nearly 20 years. And it's fair to say I never thought I'd see the day when Anwar Ibrahim actually became Prime Minister of Malaysia. But if following Malaysian politics from afar has taught me anything, it's that anything is possible, especially unlikely comebacks. After years in the political wilderness and in jail on politically motivated charges, Anwar finally became Prime Minister three weeks ago after managing to negotiate a ruling coalition, coalition with various other parties following the election in which his Pakatan Harapan bloc emerged as the biggest um, bloc in a hung parliament. Three weeks into his new government, he's appointed a cabinet, but there are many questions about what sort of leader he will be, how long he might last in office, and where Malaysia is heading, both in domestic terms and in terms of its role in Southeast Asia and the world. And I'm delighted to be joined by a top panel of experts today to discuss these questions and more. Um, so first up, we have Trisha Yeo. She's the CEO of the Institute for Democracy and Economic Affairs, or IDEAS. Uh, that's a public policy think tank in Kuala Lumpur. And Trisha also worked in the Selangor state government previously when it was under the control of a previous Anwar-linked coalition. We also have Jalil Rashid, who has recently taken on a job as managing director at the Tony Blair Institute for Global Change. He's a former fund manager and CEO in Malaysia and Singapore, and he was previously appointed by the 2018 Pakistan Harapan government as the CEO of PNB, uh, which, was, which is a large state investment fund. And last, but by no means least, um, it's great that we have Bridget Welsh with us. She is an independent scholar, political analyst, and consultant on political risk in Kuala Lumpur. Uh, she's an accomplished author, among other achievements, and is currently an honorary research associate with the University of Nottingham Asia Research Institute, Malaysia. Their full impressive bios are all online, and I won't dwell any further on their achievements so we can get on with the main business of the day. Unfortunately, uh, Liu Chin Tong, MP, couldn't be with us today in the end. Unfortunately for us, uh, but fortunately for him, he was appointed a Deputy Minister of Trade at the weekend, and he's had to go to Brussels to join the EU ASEAN meeting, which is currently ongoing. And before we get going, one final reminder that this webinar is on the record. Um, we'll hopefully be putting a recording on our website later. We're going to have a discussion for about 30 or 40 minutes between us, and then we're going to open up to your questions. So please leave your questions in the Q&A box, and we'll come to them. Tell us who you are and your affiliation. And we can either ask your question for you or we can unmute you and you can ask it yourself. Now, let's get on with the main business of the day. I'm going to turn to you first, um, Tricia, just to explain, especially for people who haven't been following things as closely as, as obviously uh, all the panelists have. Um, how did Anwar manage to come to power in the last few weeks after, you know, coming through this, this hung parliament where his party was, his party block was the, the biggest um, but he didn't have a majority. How has he managed to secure power? Okay, hi everyone. Um, good afternoon from a sunny tropical Kuala Lumpur. Uh, and hello to all of you in Chatham House from where I understand it's an icy cold London. Um, so just to get straight into the, to the question. Um, so I think just a little bit of background, which is that most analysts already believed going into the election that there would be no single coalition that would cross the simple majority mark. So the fact that it was a hung parliament was something that was uh, very predicted. It was expected. Um, it was what happened after that, that perhaps uh, took many by surprise. So I think just to recap for those who were not following the elections as closely as some of us did, um, you were right that PH did form the largest number of seats at 82. Uh, that was the largest block, followed by Perikatan National uh, at 73, and Barisan National, the previous incumbent, which performed as, at its worst ever, securing only 30 seats. So the magic number at that time was obviously 112. 
to get a simple majority of 222. Um, and because of some seats that were not yet counted at that time, we are talking about the very first week when there was still a hung parliament situation and you know the majority that was needed at that time was 111. Um, initially, in the early days, it looked very much like an ensemble that would consist of, and, and this is really an alphabet soup, uh, but I think those who are familiar with Malaysian politics, it looked initially like a coalition would be formed consisting of Perikatan National, Barisan National, as well as with the components from Sarawak and Sabah, mm -hmm. GPS and GRS. Um, but in the days that followed, the tide eventually shifted to PH having the advantage and several things actually uh, worked in Anwar Ibrahim's favor towards this. So first, there was an anti-party hopping law that was passed in Malaysia last year in 2021. And there were also internal party declarations from AMNO that determined, and this is still a point of dispute, I think this is something we can talk about, uh, that all 30 AMNO MPs were actually obliged to move on block according to their leader's decision. So this is where they went with the president's decision. Uh, second, I think the king also had met with the various leaders of the various coalitions. Um, in PN's case, Mohidin Yassin, in PH's case, Anwar Ibrahim, and the king requested for a unity government to be formed between them. Uh, Muhyiddin Yassin said that he did not want this unity government because they believed that they had the numbers from 115 statutory declarations signed. And this was accepted by Anwar Ibrahim, who wanted to see this unity government. And of course, um, in the days of this kerfuffle, the BN and PH actually successfully put together a deal to form the Perak state government. So this was one of the three states that were holding the election simultaneously, not very much uh, paid attention to at the federal level. Most attention was at the national level, but the fact that there were you know, cooperations at that level meant that this also helped to pave the way for what could happen at the national level. And of course, finally, the big block of Sarawak, uh, GPS stating that they would leave the decision to the king. So this actually reversed an earlier endorsement of Mohidin. Um, now, the big thing that I have not yet said is the relationship between Anwar Ibrahim and Zahid Hamidi. The two of them have a friendship that goes back a long way. And if not for Zahid's support of the 30 MPs, this unity or mix or whatever you want to call it, coalition government would not have been formed. So that's how it happened uh, in a sort of play-by-play. -play. And we can talk a lot more about the legal uh, you know, details of what transpired and also whether the anti-party hopping law is in effect today because we have also seen some shifts just in the last few days uh, from Sabah. So I think I'll stop there for now, Ben. Thanks. Thanks, Trisha. And uh, Jalil, I might come to you next on this question of, of Anwar and uh, Zahid Hamidi, who's the deputy PM now and the president of, of UMNO, which, of course, um, you know, ruled uh, Malaysia for most of the time since independence. And Anwar kind of was a, a youth leader in UMNO before being ousted by Mahathir back in 1998. That's kind of the some of the messy history. But what is the basis, um, Jalil, do you think of this alliance between um, UMNO and Anwar's coalition? How much is it about the personal relationship? between Zahid and Anwar? And how much um, is it to do with the, the party seeing eye to eye? How much is it just sheer real politique? Yeah, I think if you look at um, the Malaysian political leaders, um, they all have been um, a, a, a spin-off of UMNO, right? All the parties that exist today, whether it's PKR, whether it's Bersatu, all these parties all came from ex -Amno. So they all know each other. If you're around that same age group and senior leaders, you kind of know each other, you grew up together. Um, so I think that is a personal relationship. Uh, in, in private, they're all very close to each other. In public, obviously, there is a certain amount of rhetorics that need to be said. Uh, I think the bigger challenge uh, and why this came in is probably survival, right? Uh, Anwar needed the numbers. Um, they had enough to kind of pull them through, uh, but also they were decimated, when I say they, as, as in Barisan National, uh, and they needed a rejuvenation of sorts. So being in the government is an opportunity for them to kind of 
uh, sure, we have matured, we are rebuilding our party, uh, and, and we're heeding the country's call to close ranks and, and unite. Um, so I, th- I think that is, that is, I think the friendship maybe helped the conversation. Uh, definitely, there are uh, interests on both sides of the parties to kind of want to work together with each other, uh, definitely. And I say that uh, Malaysia has taken a, a step towards political maturity. And I think we've grown a lot over the last five years, I have to say. Um, and um, I think we're trying to find our way about how this unity government uh, is formed, how, how do we work together uh, beyond the fact that the politicians are okay with each other. I think the bigger battle is trying to convince your own supporters that we can work together because the party lines, the battle lines have been drawn so hard um, over, over the years that they've kind of gone out there campaigning, we can't work with you and you, uh, but now we have to work together. Um, so in a way, it's not a bad thing. It kind of neutralizes a bit of the rhetorics, but how, um, how that can be then institutionalized moving forward is, is something that uh, only time will tell. Thanks. Thanks, Jalil. And obviously in the UK, we've had a lot of our own uh, political instability as well. So always looking <laughs> for lessons about how we can consolidate our democracy too. Um, Brid- Bridget, I want, I want to come to, to you next um, to ask a bit more in a bit more detail about this you know, coalition, but you know, chiefly between you know, Anwar's bloc and, and UMNO. I mean, given he's kind of painted himself you know, to Malaysians and to the, to the world as hero of reformacy, of, of reform, um, how are we to understand what this means for kind of his reformist credentials? And I guess not just to the outside world, but many of his strongest supporters in Malaysia um, believe that he was sort of pitching himself against the powers that be. We know that Amno uh, as a party and, and Zahid himself are facing um, various different um, accusations and cases of financial wrongdoing and corruption still. So what are we to make of, of what this tells us about Anwar and his reform credentials and kind of the desire for for deeper reform in Malaysia. Um, thanks, Ben, and thanks everybody for inviting me. I would say just, uh, I wanna speak first to the question that they were speaking to a little bit, because I have a slightly different view. I think one thing that wasn't mentioned in the conversation about the elite dynamics is the way that the opposition leader, now no longer the opposition leader, but one of the key opposition figures responded to the king. I think this was a pivotal chance, uh, change uh, where things he rejected a unity government. But I think the other underlying driver of a lot of this has nothing has more to do with the political base of these parties as opposed to their individual storylines and in elite dynamics and interests, which I think are we're all pivotal. But I think the, the fact is, is that one coalition only represented one community and the rest of the coalitions represented uh, uh, others. Uh, and I think this is something that was very important for a perspective of what the notions of unity meant. Uh, um, when you have one co- the opposition really only getting support from one ethnic community and other opposition uh, having more representation uh, with, of course, Borneo parties moving e- either side. It's a different dynamic. As to the question of whether or not Anwar is a reformer, um, you know, we can always ask that question uh, uh, whether or not he's ever been a reformer. Uh, he's spoken a lot about rhetoric. Um, I, I think that what's going to be key to note to see whether or not what he delivers on. I do think that there are um, um, some very significant issues uh, that I think uh, uh, with the composition of his cabinet that uh, that really do cast a pale on the issues of reform, uh, particularly uh, many of his, the people in his cabinet are tainted with corruption allegations. Um, and I think that there's also a situation where there's uneven competency of, of uh, some of the different um, ministries. Um, so in order to have a political compromise, there's not necessarily the issues of um, questions of being able to actually have key deliverables. Um, you know, it is, uh, we have to be careful not to be too early to prejudge. Um, you know, uh, he continues to have some rhetoric of issues of reform, but I believe one of Anwar Ibrahim's biggest challenges um, uh, is a delegitimation of his reformer, reformers' credentials. Um, and I think one of the challenges of Malaysian politics is that everything's circles around an individual and uh, whether or not that was a Mahathir 
Shakespeare or an uh, Anwar. Um, and uh, I think there's still a, a lot of emphasis being placed on him. Uh, and and with with disappointments that will inevitably come, because no one person can can, can uh, appease and, and satisfy everyone. The fact of the matter is, is that you have a situation where there will be an erosion of support. Um, and, and I think it's going to be a big challenge. Um, I think that the questions of what are the reforms that he will engage in remain still ambiguous. Um, and uh, although there is a lot of promises that are coming, I think the question will be deliverable. Thanks. Thanks, Bridget. That's a really, really good point. And as a, a follower of politics and a follower of football, I've learned that great hope is usually followed by great disappointment. Um, I don't want to put too sour notes on, on things. Um, but yeah, it's a, a, important, important points you make there. And I think we'll come back to those questions of racial and ethnic dynamics a bit, a bit later. I mean, what's before we, we, I guess we get to sort of what we think Anwar might focus on, what, Trisha, do you think are the biggest challenges um, facing um, the government right now? So um, many, many challenges, to be honest. And just on that note about, you know, the greater hope comes greater disappointment. I think this is something that the PH... Uh, probably will learn, I hope, uh, from its previous experiences, because when it came in, in, in 2018, as the government then, uh, it, which only lasted for 22 months, there were tremendous amounts of uh, hopes pinned on that government from all sides. And I think the sort of expectations mounted on the current government, uh, we have to also be careful not to call it a PH government, um, is, you know, maybe moderated by that experience. So that said, I think there are four main challenges, uh, in my opinion. The first is really the economic situation. I think Anwar already came in, well, his first task, and he also met with the civil servants uh, on a Sunday to do this, is to talk about the cost of living issues. It really is the economic issue. Um, many analysts have talked about the potential global recession that we are going to be facing next year. Um, already, Malaysia has been suffering from this twin crisis of the post-pandemic situation, as well as um, the Russia-Ukraine war, which has impacted upon inflation. And how is the government going to balance the books, essentially, on its existing squeeze fiscal situation, while at the same time addressing uh, you know, the cost of living, inflation, especially for food. So that's one on the economic issues. Uh, second is, I think, you know, we all have these expectations that Anwar will be able to deliver on institutional reforms. But I think in reality, how possible is this going to happen within such a mixed coalition? Um, you know, institutional reforms don't happen overnight. I think the kind of reforms that we saw under the Ismail Sabri administration, um, just happened to take place after a series of uh, after a series of events, which included actually a very weak UMNO at the time. So it would be interesting to see whether the coalition, as it stands today, would be able to achieve uh, those institutional reforms that they have committed to, right, um, in the various manifestos. Um, the third would be the various political tensions within government. I think the question about government stability is what many, many investors are asking. And while we have a vote of confidence on the 19th of, the, of December, uh, that will be the first test, but there are other tests to come, especially and including the AMNO uh, party election that must take place by May next year. So how do we balance that stability uh, with the kinds of reforms that the government needs to do? Um, I think also coupled with that, is the fact that you have a very mixed ideological uh, coalition within the cabinet. So will they be able to see eye to eye on certain things? Um, there's one thing that has come up recently, which is the fact that the government has signed and ratified an international multilateral agreement called the CPTPP. And there have been some calls for the government to roll back on the CPTPP, and that would actually look disastrous in international eyes. So again, this kind of mixed ideology within the cabinet and um, fourth, I think it's really about this. I, I, I actually don't, I want to refrain from also just naming it um, a religious Islamist trend because, and some others have also said this, it's more like, it's more, it's looking more like an ethno 
nationalist trend rather than one that is just premised on religion. And I think you know this is going to come up again and, and again in this conversation. But how do we how how does Anwar in his leadership position play the role that he has played in the past, which is well bridging the gap? Um, and creatively countering the sort of negative narrative that has emerged in a strong way, uh, not just during the campaign, but thereafter, especially among the more hardcore Malay conservatives. So that, I think, number four is probably the biggest challenges uh, to date. Thanks, Trisha. That's re really um, helpful overview of the, of the key, key questions, really succinctly put. And I think we're going to drill into some of them in it shortly. I might come to Bridget in a, in a bit to ask about government stability and maybe some of those um, religious and nationalist questions. But Jill, I want to come to you first on the economy, which Trisha mentioned first. I mean, to some, in some senses to outsiders, Malaysia looks like a pretty good economic story, right? Apart from the global financial crisis and COVID, the economy tends to grow in four or five percent a year in GDP terms. Inflation, I think, is much lower than it is in, in the UK. Obviously, Malaysia has a you know, reasonably diversified economy with service sector and, and natural resources. So what what are the key problems you think that that Anwar needs needs to focus on when it comes to to the economy? Yeah. So yes, well, from a, from an external perspective, the numbers are all quite decent right, relative to the rest of the emerging markets. But I think if you delve a bit deeper, uh, uh, that there is. Uh, a good amount of pump priming as well over the years that uh, that has fueled a lot of the government debt as well. Uh, and a lot of that, um, then if you break that down further, there's a great amount of subsidies as well that has kept the inflation rate uh, down, uh, which, which is which is ne necessary given that um, you know, there is a, a large amount of the population who, who need that sort of support. The greater challenge would be that the subsidy bill has been increasing steadily every single year. Um, it's because uh, there is a correlation to subsidy bills going up and urbanization rate growing as well. As people move to the cities, they start consuming more and, and this is where the subsidy bill keeps on going up. That needs to be managed. That, in, that needs to be managed. Malaysia as an economy, uh, they spend more on operating expenditure than they spend on capital expenditure. And for a growing country, you, it should be the other way around. And a lot of this is subsidies. How that is to be removed needs to be done in a holistic, progressive way. Uh, there needs to be targeted subsidies. There's been a lot of debate about this, about how it can be done. I don't think it's impossible. Malaysia has an ID system, has a good payment platform. It can be done with good political will. It can be done. That is one thing that they need to tackle. And I would put that in a longer term bucket. When I say longer term, probably a five year bucket. It cannot be done overnight. What that needs to be done immediately uh, is, is stemming the probably the cost of living issue on a shorter uh, term. A lot of this would involve having very difficult conversations with some companies who control um, a lot of the supply chain and, and are the middlemen uh, in a lot of these key commodities. Uh, and he's, he's shown that um, quite quickly with rice, uh, although the amount is small, uh, that can be done across the other um, key uh, food um, commodities. Um, the other thing I would say longer term is that, again, Malaysia's economy, uh, as you correctly pointed out, it is diversified from a commodity point of view, but it is also exporting a lot of things in its raw form. Um, it, there is not a big value added industry, and that is just plantation alone, a back of the envelope calculation I did just now was probably about 80 to 100 billion ringgit uh, economy that could be that could be uh, developed if, if that's done. Um, so all these are, are perhaps things that we need to kind of cobble together as an economic master plan. Uh, and and that, that is something that's quite important for, I think, to give that sort of economic vision, where are we headed the next five years and 10 years? How is it gonna look like? How is our revenue uh, uh, going to look like? Our revenue mix gonna look like? And then the third would be, I would say, I would largely put it in, in um, under the bracket of governance, right? Uh, GLCs own a large chunk of corporate Malaysia and they have been, and that number has actually been increasing. You know, there's been more entrepreneurs who have been selling out to the state uh, and they've been exiting. Um, my view on this is that the less the government does, the better uh, because 
because they they don't need to over they don't need to put their hands in everything. Um, I think there was a a time where ownership was equated to control. And I do understand that there are certain industries that the government wants to control as strategic, but it can be done by way of regulations rather than by way of ownership. Um, so I think that is something that I think needs to be done. Uh, otherwise, uh, we run into this constant argument and, and conversation about why the GLCs are inefficient. Um, when, 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 when you're a monopoly, there is absolutely no incentive for you to be, to be efficient. So those are things I would say longer term and, and shorter term. Thanks. Thanks, Jill. And yeah, GLC is obviously government linked companies for those um, to, who yeah. don't know. Um, Bridget, I might come to you next on this question of political stability. And maybe if you have a view, um, which I, I know you do, uh, on this on the question of kind of the, the is rising Islamism um, debates or eth ethno nationalism. But on, on political stability, I mean, do you think um, Anwar can kind of keep this cobbled together? coalition together and 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 how how much sort of time and energy is that going to take so i want to speak to the previous question before i speak to this one sure. um i think that um uh, i think that there are three areas that i'd like to expand on the areas of the economy um number one malaysia needs more taxes and more revenue and this is a real hard political um uh, nut to crack number two you know the one the child the at, the, the, the economy needs to restructure, the domestic economy needs to restructure, moving away from a patronage contract-based economy that is based on, that ties into corruption. And, and I think this is, uh, I, we see some small signs of this changing, but it's going to be very difficult. And the third thing is that, that it, you know, it, Malaysia needs a more meaningful social safety net, and it can't just be targeted subsidies. It has to be much more than that. And I think that, um, you know, when you look from below, as opposed to from from the top but uh, you, you really see a very different circumstances the growth is not trickling down to the society and this explains part in part what we saw in the election results uh, we see people who want a different type of economic future they're being displaced and this goes to be ties into the issues of instability I think um, Malaysia has now got a new much stronger opposition um, from a perspective of uh, I think we're likely to see this opposition have its own uh, shadow cabinet for the first time. We're likely to see a situation where this opposition um, has a kind of different righteousness. I mean, all oppositions have a sense of righteousness. The previous one did, the previous, uh, who helped to form this government. I think they're going to, uh, they use this um, kind of uh, black and white uh, assessments. Um, uh, and I think that they're, they have a lot of mobilization. Uh, while they, they won 30 uh, four percent of the seats, and 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 Harapan, for example, only won thirty-seven percent of the seats. Um, they continue to have a large section of the of the majority community in Malaysia, um, and so uh, I think that the issues of race, racialized identity politics, um, and the ability to mobilize that will be a very powerful destabilizing force. I think that we can look at instability from many different levels. At the elite level, obviously, what happens in political parties and coalitions actors, I think are important, UMNO being the key among them, at least a third of the UMNO members uh, in the current 30 are not comfortable with this current government. I would say that uh, uh, the fact that they're going to have a party election and the current uh, president of the party really brought the party to the biggest defeat the party has ever faced, um, he's going to have to face the music uh, uh, in the next four or five months uh, in that process. And there will inevitably be some rocking and changings from that. Um, but I think that the election uh, the state elections will be, I think, to me, the most important and interesting arena to see where we see destabilization happening from, from the perspective of um, the opposition forces gaining ground. Um, and, and, and also the fact that they will mobilize over identity politics. We expect to see protests uh, that could emerge. Um, and, and these were a factor that helped to destabilize the first Harapan government in 2018. And finally, the key thing is, is of course, the destabilization can happen from internal conflicts and not managing those conflicts. Um, uh, uh, and I think, you know, I spoke earlier about the potential delegitimation of uh, Harapan uh, from a perspective of its political ba 
base. I mean, that's already starting, although, although many people would actually want to give the party, many, there is a lot of goodwill. The question is whether or not this is capitalized on. But I think that, you know, uh, uh, this, the coalition um, has to have key deliverables. Um, and in particular, you know, to be able to work together on the economy, you have three very important, very conflicting personalities managing the aspects of the economy, and whether or not they work together to deal with some of the things Jalal spoke about and, and some of the broader issues I've tried to build on for his comments, I think we see a very uh, difficult situation. Um, I think the next six to eight months is going to be the big test of the government, uh, uh, whether or not they can get through the UMNO elections and the state elections and be able to consolidate and build trust among themselves. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Bridget. All, all good points. And I, and I think it's, it's probably fair to say the racial dynamics had you know, a fair part to play in the collapse of the last Pakistan Harapan government. There was obviously a lot of personality and, and, and ground up issues as well. Um, but those those elite elite level tensions as well and and how the kind of racial issues cut across from from the ground up um, is, is quite important. So I want to. I want to come back to you, Trisha, on the point you mentioned, which I think was referring to to pass the Islamic Party, which I think um, was the biggest single party in terms of seats on, on its own and, and had an improved performance this time. And um, that has raised quite a lot of concerns, as you were alluding to. But what, yeah, what what drove um, Pass's performance, do you think, Trisha? And yeah, do you think it does sort of presage um, difficult times ahead? So I think um, uh, for some context, um, PAS won 49 seats. It is the single largest party um, in all of parliament today. And this represents, you know, about 70% of the entire coalition, Perikata Nationals, uh, 70, well, 70, then 73, but now 74 seats as of the recent by-election in Padang Sarai. Um, so yes, PAS, uh, again, for background, has always been very strong in its uh, East Coast strongholds of Kelantan and Trunganu, more Kelantan than Trunganu. And the sort of wave that we see in this election, uh, sort of a crescent shape, right, northeasterly wave um, in which PAS and Perikatan National, so there were also some candidates from Bersatu that contested under the PAS flag. Uh, in some of the, the Northeast states where they practically swept many, many of the seats in Perlis, Kedah, Kelantan, and Trunganu. Um, these are the states that are more rural, um, that are less developed, and are also three states that are going to face state elections next year. So what we are hearing is that um, the three states would like to hold simultaneous state elections uh, Kedah, Kelantan, and Trunganu, and possibly do it as early as the first quarter just because they would like to ride on the current momentum that they do have. So, um, okay, PAS as an Islamic party, th there is just so much history to unpack there, and we can't do it justice in this session. Um, but there have been several reasons that have been put forward for this swing to PAS. Uh, which I think, in fact, Bridget has written about. So one thing is, one way to look at it is, and, and this, and I, and I have to say that there has been some um, concern and perhaps uh, fear amongst non-Muslim communities in Malaysia as to this swing, because I think it's not something that many of them really saw or expected to happen. Um, and that's also unhealthy for the eventual national unity and harmony of the nation. But a second re real factor that I think caused this drive was a swing away from Barisan National. So if we see it as um, the fact that there was a large Malay electorate that was simply not satisfied with the kinds of cracks that they were already seeing within AMNO, the leadership tussles that were not resolved, the corruption cases, uh, there was already a term called the court cluster among the leaders of AMNO, um, which you know, have now been incorporated into Anwar Ibrahim's cabinet. So therefore, the issue of whether Anwar can also stand up on his good governance narrative, I think that's, um, that, that was a side issue. So 
to interpret the swing to pass as if solely it was a swing towards greater Islamization of the country, I think is something we need to be very cautious about uh, when in fact there were multiple factors for it, just like how there were multiple factors that led to the PH win in 2018. So people vote for various different reasons and the swing away from Barisan National was a further sort of death knell for the party, uh, a signal that the party had not yet been able to resolve its internal differences. Um, having said that, I think it will be really interesting in the upcoming state elections next year. So not just for Kedah, Kelantan and Tringanu, because um, the recent by-election in Padang Sarai also shows you that this sort of swing to pass is going to be a permanent feature for the time being until and unless UMNO can reform and reshape itself from, from within. Um, but what will be really interesting to look at would be the more urban states. So the other three states that are going into election next year will be Selangor, Negeri Sembilan, and Penang. Uh, all three states are currently held by Pakatan Harapan. And all three states, like all states in, in the country or anywhere in the world, also have some rural base, uh, less than the other states. But uh, what I would be interested in seeing is how much of the strong vote base that PH currently has will be eroded by past slash past representatives uh, within the broader Perikata National Coalition. Uh, so I think I'll stop there for now. Thanks, Ben. Thank Thanks, Jose. And Bridget, did you want to come in? Yeah, on, I want to. I want to jump in uh, partly because uh, this is sort of what I do. Look at look at results um, of the twenty percent uh, of the vote gain that Perkta National made compared to the traditional base of support, which had been around thirty five percent for PAS for the last set of elections. I would say only about half of that, um, uh, not at most, was more of a, a kind of green tsunami in terms of the the element. Uh, um, it, we can really see in the composition, and I've now looked at about a third of the seats uh, nationally. I'm still waiting for the data from, from all of it, uh, but I, there are two, there, there are two or three trends that I can really point to. Um, number one is that we can see that, uh, uh, that, um, younger voters uh, disproportionately uh, moved um, uh, very much towards Perkta National, in part because of the social media campaigning, in part because of uh, uh, th they voted not, they were voting away from UMNO and they voted as a protest vote. And I think, you know, keep in mind that we've had protest votes in Malaysia historically from elections from 99 to 9 onwards. So the last four or five elections, with the exception of maybe 2004, has been largely driven by protest votes. So I think this was very important to understand Understand that the se the second element uh, uh, that we can see is that um, uh, they managed to capture uh, female voters at a much higher level. Um, uh, we can, uh, in terms of uh, the particular drive, um, and then they won uh, a large section of uh, the traditional vote that went to UMNO. Um, even in the more recent by election, the, the preliminary re results that the local level that I've seen, um, you know, suggest that you know the BN cannot hold its base. It was only able to transfer at most a third of the base towards uh, towards a new uh, configuration. So, you know, of all of what I've said here is it, the most important driver here are younger voters, <laughs> a third of the electorate of which when you capture 40 to 45 percent of them, you're going to have big gains. Um, and that's what it looks like from a lot of these seats. Um, and I think that it has a profound transformation. And, you know, I spoke earlier about the destabilizing force in Malaysia, and again, we can look at it at the elite level or from below. I mean, the drivers of of what's happening in Malaysia are the young people, and 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 you know, Mike. One of my concerns about this Anwar government is that it doesn't have much youth representation or even youth agenda in terms of a recognition of what's happening for young people. And these are the people who are going to be coming in in high numbers and help to change what the next results are going to be in the next election. And they will serve as a kind of destabilizing drive or a drive for change or a better or drive for better governance, which we're seeing in all these things together. Thanks. Thanks, Bridget. And obviously, it really interesting in the context for yeah, those who aren't following it, but Malaysia did lower the voting age to 18 for this election as well. So there, there was there was a shift there. And on that question of democracy, I want to broaden out a bit and come back to you, Jalil, because you said at the beginning that you're sort of optimistic in a sense. And it's been a pretty 
depressing time for people following democracy in Southeast Asia and much of the world in the last few years. But do you think, you know, there is a positive trend here? Is this a sort of, are we seeing a consolidation or a maturation of, of democracy in, yeah. in Malaysia from your perspective? I think, uh, firstly, I think it's a, it, it's a necessary step towards a, a, mat- a, a maturing democracy. Uh, we've had two, um, two transitions of power that's been peaceful. You know, there's been no uh, violence on the streets and everything. Uh, one can argue it's been messy, but, you know, that's what democracy is. It's something we have to live with. Um, so I think a unity government, in my view, or a uh, is, is something that would be a norm and it's not it's not an exception it's going to be a norm I think people just need to learn to work with each other um, so I think the good thing is that we're, we're kind of maybe seeing a blurring of the line somewhat and, and my hope is that you know the rhetorics may also kind of maybe dampen down because I do worry about the racial uh, religion uh, rhetorics uh, and I've always held the belief that you know politics everywhere even in Malaysia is always going to be challenging, but politicians will find a way to go to the edge of the cliff and pull themselves back. Uh, and that's what they do. Um, but, um, but what could damage the country is race and religion. And that's something that whoever is in power needs to stamp down. Um, so, uh, and, but I think on the, on the flip side is that um, things will be slow and expectations need to be dampened as well. Uh, I, think that, I think everyone expects magic. Um, you know, I've been speaking to people after the prime minister took over, people have been like, oh, it's been one week, it's been two weeks, you've not done this, you've not done that. I mean, it, it takes a long time. It takes a long time. You have to mobilize the civil service. Um, you know, the, the messaging has been good so far, uh, but we do need to see the execution. That's where, like most countries, we fall short uh, on the execution side. Um, so I think the expectations need to come down a notch and somewhere there needs to be a, a middle ground. There will be absolutely you can say right now there'll be disappointments at the end of that uh, five years there'll be a lot of things that people want to be implemented and achieved which won't come uh, and that's just a, a, a prioritization of sorts um, leading my own personal uh, experience uh, running the fund uh, I think a lot of Pakatan's learnings from from 2018 was how they didn't prioritize things that could move the needle quicker uh, but sometimes dwell on things that were uh, that, that took up a lot of political capital. So I think uh, they're much more mature now uh, and, and trying to put the bullets in um, where, where it's going to matter most. Um, so we, we have to see. So yes, one, I'm, I, I, I like the certain aspects of the political maturity that people are having conversations with each other. Um, but I think that needs to go on longer uh, and it needs to be a norm. And that would be a challenge. And, and Trisha, what's your sense? I mean, you've worked in, in local government. You, you, know, you run a think tank focused on democracy and economic affairs now. Like if Zooming out, so how do you see sort of Malaysian democracy developing? Are things positive or, or do you worry about you know, young people's frustrations and, and the slow pace of institutional change? I mean, look, um, you know, people were very, very excited about the fact that this was the first Undi 18, but that's what was called, uh, the lowering of the voting age to 18. And, you know, ultimately, people came out to vote. We had a large voter turnout. It was much higher than what was expected uh, for several reasons. There were flooding, there was flooding um, taking place in some parts of the country. And there was always concern that the floods would actually impede voters from going out, there's still COVID, uh, there's a COVID wave at the moment in Malaysia. And we felt that, you know, youth would be apathetic and not interested, but I think that um, has already been proven otherwise. Then there's also this uh, concern, again, among the investors about political instability and just addressing the question of stability once again, because UMNO as a dominant party fell in 2018, uh, we can no longer ever go back to that particular situation. At least I don't think so. And looking forward, the ways in which government will be formed in the future will be formed as how we have seen it in the last month. Um, Coalitions formed based on negotiation and concessions. So for what it's worth, my message to 
potential economic investors out there and people who are looking at stability um, is this answer. The answer that many governments around the world have had to grapple with. Um, it is not a new thing. Post-election coalition formation is not new. And if it is the new normal that we need to deal with, then it's best that we look for um, the things that can make these can make such coalition governments stable and what could that look like? So that could look like number one, you know, um, agreements within the coalition, within the government that may span a certain fixed period of time. So uh, an, an agreement like the Ismail Sabri administration previously signed with the opposition, uh, essentially a confidence and supply agreement that provides um, the supply that is required to keep the government in place, whether it's for one year, two years, five years, with, which is the entire five-year term. So those kinds of mechanisms in place, I think, would allow for some stability. And then the second big thing is that because there is so much stake now for every coalition and every party in which they can lose and they can eventually be a loser, whether it's at the federal or the state level, the incentives now are higher for them to create those institutional rules in place that allow for a level playing field. And these are the things that as an independent think tank, we would like to put forward to the decision makers of the day. So things like having equal constituency development funding, to have political funding act that really equalizes the parties on all sides, having public funding to parties that are not biased in nature. I think these are some of the rules that we can put forward um, to, to set things place in place. And of course, ensuring that the institutions that are there to implement these rules will also be independent from the executive. It's a tall order. We have a long way to go. Uh, you're talking about institutions like the Attorney General's Chambers, like Parliament, Judiciary, the Malaysian Anti-Corruption Commission. All of these institutions now become even more important and it becomes even more imperative um, for them to remain independent and unbiased. But I know that it's a long way away, but my call would be that uh, the stakes are higher, you can lose, therefore get the institutions right. Thanks, thanks, Shisha, all really good points. And I guess losers consent is important in a democracy, but also kind of losers engagement. After you've lost, how do you, how do you engage with, with the system? Um, Bridget, did you want to, to add something? Yeah, I would say, um, you know, I echo a lot of what was said earlier about a peaceful transition that, you know, we've had a lot of, we've had five prime ministers in Malaysia in five years, so the economy works well without them, <laughs> even when they change. Um, I think, uh, you know, um, then they're, they're different mixed, mixed signals. I mean, we've seen, I think democracy is not just about elections. We've seen the expansion of civil society, expansion of think tanks that Tricia is part of. We see a lot more participation in very different levels. Um, I think, you know, Malaysia is a success story compared to a lot of its regional neighbors, and I think that needs to be emphasized. But I do want to caution one thing, in which I think is that Malaysia still remains highly polarized uh, ethnically and re along religious lines. And I think we can see this in the voting patterns. And there, and there is this mobilization of identity politics and populism um, because these are easy things to do and the social media and others that, that come to that. Uh, um, and these are things that are, are really difficult to, to, to manage um, uh, from a perspective of uh, of the the, the realities uh, of 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 a, of, a, of a very complex society and very uh, and, uh, and I think you know the solutions to these issues I think rest a lot with uh, transforming and reforming the institutions in the economy of many of which Patricia spoke about um, but I think that you know it, it, there are these challenges are real um, and uh, and I think that that this government had, to a certain degree is in the best position to 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 address some of these issues, uh, but uh, it, it, it's no no means an easy task, uh, and I think that should be highlighted um, because uh, Malaysians see their country very differently. They have different co concepts of legitimacy, concepts of the way they see, they view things, um, and and especially when you when you get out of Kuala Lumpur. Yeah, thanks. Oh, really good points, um, Bridget. I, I want to turn to some audience questions. We've had quite a few about China. Um, and how Anwar is going to manage China. So yeah, I'm, I'm wondering, uh, how do we think he will deal with, with Xi Jinping, with Beijing, and how is he going to 
handle Malaysia's positioning, you know, vis-a-vis US-China rivalry, which is really the defining uh, geopolitical feature of our times. I don't know who who wants to jump in here. Um, Trisha, do you have a view or, or, or Jaleel or Bridget? Yeah, who, who wants to go first? Um, uh, well, oh, Jaleel, go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> Guess we should have time to think. Um, I, I think I'm, I think looking at how Anwar has dealt with it, I think he would he would be very neutral on this. He wouldn't over you know uh, over promote China versus the US. He's been quite um, quite sleek about doing that. Uh, he has um, ordered a review of um, uh, one of the disputed islands and say they work together with Singapore. So I think he would probably go down the let's be friends with everybody uh, route, uh, but, but, probably, uh, but probably curtail on certain stuff uh, behind the scenes, especially uh, I think when it comes to China, there's been a lot of concerns, not just Malaysia, but globally about their influence in, in funding infrastructure projects. Um, so I think, uh, I think from, from the back end, that could be maybe um, uh, uh, neutralized a bit, uh, whereas in the front, uh, saying that everyone is welcome. Uh, I think that that's how I, I see. Um, he's, he's never one to kind of go and, um, and, and kind of make enemies with one particular country over the next. He's been so far, that's been the line that he has taken. And I think it, that will remain. Uh, it's also that, you know, they remain very important trading partners, both of them, uh, and you need both of them in a certain way. Uh, key is to just make sure that uh, no one has uh, too much of influence, especially when it comes to uh, projects which are funded. Trisha, do you have, do you want to add something? Uh, sure. Actually, my answer is that whichever prime minister and whichever government Malaysia has, we are not going to necessarily stick our necks out one way or the other excessively. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Malaysia is a small open trading economy. Uh, we have signed and ratified both RCEP, uh, which is seen to be more a China response to the then TPP. We have the now ratified the CPTPP, which was seen to be US led, but then US pulled out. So the point here I'm making is that we will always remain neutral and friendly to all parties. Mm -hmm. uh, China is an important trading partner, as is the US. And if Anwar does make decisions on reviewing certain projects, uh, it would be probably on other sorts of bases. Uh, he has said that there will be certain projects that are reviewed on the basis of non-transparency. And just on the issue of uh, Chinese infrastructure projects in Malaysia, the big ones, of course, would be the ECRL, the East Coast Rail Link. Um, ideas, the think tank that I'm you know, part of. We've done quite a lot of research on the BRI-related um, infrastructure projects in Malaysia. And I think there, if there is anything to consider, it would be whether or not um, there will be yet another realignment considered for the ECRL, which has been realigned several times already. Um, so I think I'll just stop there. But oh, one, one last note, which is that if you look at the PH manifesto, um, they have also taken a similar position of playing that third party, you know, neutral ground. But I think more importantly, beyond the US-China relationship, what Malaysia needs to do is to really start resuming its position as a regional leader. If you look at ASEAN talks, if you look at, you know, economic integration, um, everything ASEAN in the past, Malaysia was at the forefront of that. And we've taken a, a back seat in the last few years because of our very, you know, myopic, perhaps domestic political issues. And it is time that we continue to take that position again, uh, which, you know, if not, then it's very quickly overtaken by our neighbors as well. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Shishin. We've had a, quite a linked question on foreign policy from Amitav Banerjee asking about uh, Malaysia's position on Myanmar, because it's true that Saifuddin Abdullah, the previous foreign minister, was pretty outspoken um, within Southeast Asia about um, excluding um, junta ministers from all engagement with ASEAN, who's probably pushing the toughest line in the region. And that's probably one of the areas where Malaysia was, or at least Saifuddin was providing some leadership. Um, Bridget, um, yeah, do you have you on the foreign policy and, and a specific question of whether or not Anwar was going to continue that tough line on Myanmar within ASEAN? 
So I want to make three quick points. Um, first of all, the West is obsessed with this U.S.-China stuff, and Southeast Asia doesn't really care about the U.S.-China dynamic. And I, I think that, uh, uh, so that's my first point. The second point is, is I don't think U.S. Policy, uh, policy, US policy or China policy and Malaysia policy is neutral. I don't think it ever can be neutral. There are always interests that are involved. Um, and I think that, um, uh, but, but in this regard, I think Anwar in particular has a more advantage than any other alternative. Um, he's less inward lo lo looking. Uh, the previous prime minister was uncomfortable speaking English. <laughs> um, this uh, Kurt, you know, Anwar is a globalist. Um, he's aware of uh, what's happening, um, you know, and, and relies on his ties uh, to international actors. It was important to note that when almost immediately when he came in, the first thing he did is had his first visit from someone from outside, external legitimacy, helping to strengthen domestic legitimacy. So I think that um, no matter what country you're looking at, U.S., China, Brunei, Saudi Arabia, uh, Turkey, you're going to see uh, this government to having a much more in international engaged position, um, uh, which I think reflects the Anwar's leadership. Um, the third point is that I do think that, um, uh, well, I think Saifuddin Abdullah uh, should be given credit for taking a very strong position on Myanmar. Um, I think that uh, there were other interests. Uh, uh, that did support that, it, that, that, that included the prime minister and included other actors in the, in the foreign ministry. Um, the only challenge, however, is that Malaysia has a deep state and in and, and, and dealing with issues of immigration, we've seen some very uh, negative dynamics of re treatment of refugees, uh, Myanmar refugees in Malaysia in the last week. Um, so I think that there's still going to be, there's still going to be a kind of um, a less, uh, um, uh, uh, some con contradictions. Um, I, the current foreign minister, uh, you know, as do almost all the ministers in Malaysia in certain sectors, they have to challenge, they have, they, he, he has to f fill shoes that define the, the foreign policy. And it's going to be challenging for the foreign minister Zambri to kind of be overshadowed by Anwar in the area because Anwar is so, such a prominent international figure. Um, but I think, um, you know, what we do know of the foreign minister is that he has been aware on the issues of Myanmar. He is, uh, he is actually, um, uh, you know, I think he's going to, the ministry, it's going to take a very principled position. I don't think Malaysia is going to lead quite the same way it did before, uh, but I definitely think it's going to be on the side of uh, you know, recognizing the crimes of the junta and uh, and the, the horrors that they're inflicting on the Myanmar people. Um, thanks, thanks, Bridget. We're almost out of time, but we just I'm just got one more question um, about generational change um, because it's interesting. I guess across Southeast Asia, actually, we see kind of a lot of old leaders or veteran leaders in office. And we, we talked about the youthful kind of enthusiasm, Bridget, but I guess we haven't seen necessarily that turn into success for youthful politicians, uh, at least in terms of elite politics. So, yeah, do you, do you think, um, and maybe give me a kind of a one minute answer each. Um, I'll come to you first, Bridget. Um, yeah, do you think Malaysia could see this kind of generational shift now in elite politics with with a younger population and maybe more dynamic and animated on social media i think anwar is the last of the the previous generations shaped by the 1970s uh you know moved in and other people and and hadia wang and others um the average cabinet has dropped age has dropped by 10 10 uh, it could have gone lower but i so we are seeing shifts and I, and i point to what i said earlier about the democracy in malaysia is not just the politicians the voices for uh, a different type of country um, uh, you're here on this panel, uh, a younger generation with people who have optimism uh, and uh, and are helping to make the country smaller, smarter, and 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 stronger. So I think we're really, um, you know, th that is that dynamism is happening. I think we're already seeing that shift. Um, I think this round of uh, elected members of parliament, we've seen much more younger people. The cabinet as well, we've seen younger people. Um, so yeah, it's it's happening, and I think this is something that will be demanded as as time goes on. And also, I think that the 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 time where leaders stay on for 10, 20 years, I think those days are long gone. A few things probably uh, history in Malaysian politics are uh, thumping two thirds majority and 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 having people stay on for twenty years. Um, so I think people are going to come and go. Um, hence why institutional reform is absolutely crucial. So the system needs to keep it together, regardless who comes in. Uh, but I'm quite confident that I think there is a much more 
uh, wider interest in younger people wanting to participate in this process. Mm. So maybe no 90 plus year old president, prime minister again. Um, and Trisha, I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> Trisha, last, last word to you on this question. All right, thank you. Um, I think that the fact that we have started talking about prime ministerial term limits is a good sign. And if this reform can actually be pushed through legislation, it will allow us to see that truly happening, uh, at least at the very top, and then this filters down. The other thing I want to talk about is um, how 2018 also transformed the way in which parties operate. So... Yes, I know uh, Amno still has a lot to do internally, but there have been some transformations. I believe that there are younger, you know, branch leaders, um, division leaders, which have emerged. And that's quite fundamental in the way we think about politics in the long run, how parties choose to reform and renew themselves. Um, ultimately, it's about the parties because the ways that cabinet members are chosen, uh, they are chosen out of a select group that the parties name. So I look forward to seeing parties transform. Uh, the pressure is on the parties to put forward younger faces as candidates as well as women. And uh, I think the future is bright for young aspiring politicians. However, on that note, the systems do need to change to ensure mm -hmm. that they can change the systems and that the systems, and when I say systems, I mean things like political corruption, political financing, all the things that actually corrupt the way politics is run in the country. Um, that needs to happen so that the individuals can influence the system and not the other way around. So I'll leave it as that. And thank you so much for this. Well, thanks so much, Richard, for ending on, and all speakers, ending on positive note and also some key action points as well of, of what people can do. That's really helpful. You've all been really insightful um, and great collaborators on this panel. So thanks so much. Thanks to my Chatham House colleagues for organizing everything and to all the audience as well for participating. This was an on the record session and we hope to put the video up soon uh, if you missed anything. So thanks so much, everyone, and see you all soon. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.